Primary healthcare practitioners have a key role to play in bringing STI epidemics under control as part of their routine everyday practice. Most STIs can be managed well in general practice and support and referral options are detailed on the local Primary Healthcare Network's Health Pathways site. Our case Jenny is a young woman who is attending a primary healthcare setting. Jenny presents to the clinic with genital symptoms. Hello Jenny, it's been a few months since I last saw you. How are you? Okay, but I'm concerned something's not right. My vaginal discharge has changed. There's more of it and it's a yellow colour. It seems to come and go. Tell me a bit more about the discharge. Is it smelly? Is there any associated vaginal itchiness? How long has this change been? It started about one week ago. It is occasionally smelly, but I haven't noticed an itch. I need to ask you some intimate questions in order to work out what is actually causing your symptoms. Is that okay with you? Yeah, no problem. I trust you. When was the last time you had any sexual activity? About two weeks ago with my boyfriend. How long has he been your regular sexual partner? Around three months now. Do you have any other partners beside him? No, not since I met him. We are only with each other. But before him, I've been quite sexually active. I had four guys in the prior three months and in the prior 12 months around 10 guys. I was not always careful with condoms, especially after a big night out. But I'm on the pill so I know I won't get pregnant. So when you're having sex, is it painful? It can be, occasionally. And is the pain high up in the pelvis or as he's entering the vagina? Maybe high up, uh, sometimes, I just can't tell for sure. Do you have any associated low abdominal pain? Any fever? Any bleeding after sex? No, nothing like that. Just this annoying discharge. When was your last period? My last menstrual period was two weeks ago. I am on the oral contraceptive pill and I'm very careful to take my pills properly so I don't get pregnant. The discharge started one week later. I thought I had thrush so I took fluconazole that I obtained over the counter at a pharmacy. But after four days, it had no effect at all. You look very worried, Jenny. Are you okay? I've done all the right things so far. I'm on the pill so I don't get pregnant. I use condoms with my new boyfriend. I'm fully vaccinated against HPV and I've had a cervical screen about eight months ago and was found to have no high-risk HPV. I'm going to have another screen in five years. I'm concerned I have an STI and I've also heard that an untreated STI can create problems when it comes to having children. I don't want kids now, but I sure do in the future, so I don't want that messed up. Yes, pelvic inflammatory disease can impact future plans to have a family. So it's important to treat any STI. So you've done the right thing, taking care of your health and coming to see me. Every young person should talk about sexual health with their GP. It's just as an important health issue as any other issue. I know that you're on the pill and that's excellent contraception but you can still get an STI if you don't use condoms. So if you don't mind, Jen, I'd like to take a look and then order some tests and find the right treatment for you. Is that okay? Yep, sounds good. Jenny has noticed a change in her vaginal discharge and this has brought her to the clinic. The common causes of this abnormal vaginal discharge include bacterial vaginosis, candidiasis, or the common STI organisms which include gonorrhea, chlamydia and mycoplasma genitalia. Now to a bit of a background on these two organisms, first a briefing on chlamydia. What is it? Chlamydia is a bacterial infection of mucosal membranes caused by chlamydia trachomatis and this is usually sexually transmitted. Chlamydia may cause asymptomatic pharyngeal or anorectal infection or even asymptomatic cervical infection. But remember, it is an important cause of pelvic inflammatory disease, infertility, and ectopic pregnancy. You should therefore test women and men under 30 years of age, and testing should be part of a young person's health check. Also, anyone with new sexual partners, individuals with symptoms of chlamydia, anyone undergoing sexual health testing, sex workers, and men who have sex with men at every site of genital contact.
When you test for chlamydia, it's usually done as part of a nested test with gonorrhea doing nucleic acid amplification testing. And we test the following sites. The anorectum, the pharynx, we may do a high vaginal swab in women, we could do a first pass urine on women or men, depending on the gender of the person, and the type of sexual activity involved. Self-swabbing for anal and vaginal STIs is now available for screening asymptomatic patients. Pharyngeal swabs need to include the oropharynx and the tonsils. Importantly, three sites of testing are critical in men who have sex with men. For the most updated management of chlamydia, please look at the Australian STI treatment guidelines or you may call the MSHC information line. But generally, uncomplicated treatment of chlamydia consists of taking two tablets of 500 mg of azithromycin or doxycycline 100 mg twice a day for seven days. Your patient should avoid any sexual contact for seven days and they need to notify their partners to prevent reinfection. The patient too may be retested after one to three months for reinfection. Heterosexual partners who are chlamydia positive may be treated with one gram of azithromycin. Patient provided partner therapy is available in Victoria. Here the clinician may provide a prescription to the patient in the partner's name, which is useful when the partner is unwilling or unable to attend for treatment, and this will reduce the risk of reinfection. It is legal in Victoria, and you can go to this website for the current guidelines. Patient-delivered partner therapy is important to prevent reinfection in your index patient. And now for a briefing on mycoplasma genitalium. Mycoplasma genitalium is also known as MG and shares many of the hallmarks of its better known counterpart, chlamydia. It is a sexually transmitted bacterium that infects the urinary and genital tracts of men and women. MG may cause non-specific urethritis or NSU in men and pelvic inflammatory disease or PID in women. When we examined Jenny, she was quite well. She had no lymph nodes, her vulva looked normal. The entire genitalia looked perfectly fine. When we put in a speculum, we found that she had a very runny discharge which pooled into the speculum and it was actually quite thin. Examination of the ectocervix showed a pink and smooth cervix. She had a little ectropion which bled as the cervix was touched. There was also some discharge coming from the cervical os and associated mucopus. A litmus paper test done on the vaginal fluid showed a pH of 5.5. You do a high vaginal or a cervical swab for Neisseria gonorrhea, chlamydia trachomatis and mycoplasma genitalium. You may also include testing for trichomonas vaginalis and candidiasis as well as do microscopy, culture and sensitivity. And if you're ordering mycoplasma genitalium, please also order the macrolide resistance mutation or MRM as well. Some laboratories do it as a dual diagnostic test. So they do an MGPCR and they also do the MRM testing as well. Jenny's microscopy findings showed that she had occasional polys. The amine test was positive and looking under the microscope, we found that she had a moderate amount of clue cells and epicells. In total, her Nugent score was 8. She also had Gardnerella species, but no lactobacilli. This is in keeping with a pH of 5.5, as seen in the litmus paper test. So Jenny, your results have come back. The cervical swab was negative for gonorrhea. But you actually have chlamydia and another organism called mycoplasma genitalium. These organisms are both sexually transmitted. You also have BV, which is actually bacterial vaginosis on the high vaginal swab. This is due to an imbalance of bacteria in the vagina. There's ongoing research in this area to see if BV is actually sexually transmitted. The bacterial vaginosis is treated with an antibiotic called metronidazole. This organism is the cause of the fishy smell of the vaginal discharge. 
We can treat the chlamydia with doxycycline, 100 milligrams twice a day for seven days. Until you finish the treatment, it's important not to have any sexual activity. This is about seven days. I want you to watch for signs and symptoms of PID, as the infection may be traveling upwards. So if you notice any of these symptoms, please make another appointment straight away. Okay, that sounds fine. I will be able to get in contact with a couple of guys and encourage them to get tested. But what about the MG? Well, the MG PCR test was positive and it was associated with a macrolide resistance mutation. So because you have the macrolide resistant mycoplasma, we need to add moxifloxacin to the doxycycline. So you take the doxycycline, 100 milligrams twice a day for seven days. Then once the seven days are over, you take moxifloxacin, 400 milligrams daily for the next seven days. Then it's really important to come back for a test of cure one month after starting these antibiotics, because we know that mycoplasma is a difficult organism to treat. So it's important to have this test of cure. Until you finish the treatment and clear the infection, it is important not to have sex. Thank you so much. I'll complete the course of my antibiotics and make an appointment to see you in one month. I'll be careful not to have sex until my tests are negative. If there are any problems, I'll come back earlier. And it's my responsibility as a provider to ensure contact tracing is done. This is important to curtail the spread of the infection. Are you able to tell your partners from the last three months to come in and get tested and treated if necessary? Maybe. I don't feel comfortable going back there. You can either tell the partners directly yourself or do it anonymously through the Let Them Know website if you prefer to do it that way. This information is available on our website. And sometimes that can be important for personal safety too. Or I could help you with that. There's one guy I don't want to have any contact with again, so I think using the anonymous approach with that Let Them Know app sounds like the best way. Okay then, so I'll make a note of how we're going to take care of the contact tracing then. Okay, to recap, I'll get my current boyfriend to come in for testing too. I doubt he'll have anything as I've been careful to ensure we use condoms all the time until I've had a full checkup and I'm STI free. I'll do my best to let my previous partners know to get tested and treated anonymously through that. I'll make a booking for my MG test of cure in about four weeks. Thanks so much. Contacts of MG need to be tested and treated as well, especially if they're regular sexual contacts, because our patient may get reinfected by an untreated, ongoing sexual partner. So what we say to patients then is that if you have a regular sexual partner, please bring in your partner for testing and for treatment. Your partner will be tested and will be offered exactly the same treatment as you have received. If his or her test comes back negative, we may be inclined to actually treat your regular sexual partner in exactly the same way you were treated. Because that partner's test may be falsely negative. Because the amount of MG that's present in the sample may be below the detectable limits of the test assay. The partner will get pre-treated with doxycycline. And if he or she is agreeable, then the second antibiotic, exactly the same as your patient, is provided to the patient's partner, even before the results are available, to reduce the risk of reinfection. In conclusion, in a situation like this, the clinician would need to propose a full STI screen, not just focus on the presenting symptoms. VITAL runs a course on syndromic approach to STIs, which outlines more comprehensively how STIs actually present in the clinic and how they are best dealt with as part of a routine, everyday primary healthcare practice.